Hello, everybody. It's 5.30, um, and here we are for the fourth of our sessions in construction history in New York and Chicago. And this time we're focusing on FIRE, the, the fourth of our fourth four Fs, uh, which are foundations and frames and facades and now FIRE. We introduced um, this idea um, thanks to our uh, continuing speakers, Thomas Leslie and Donald Friedman, um, as we um, rejected the idea of, of separating floors from the rest of the frame, although we'll get the, the evolution of floors um, in, the, in the adaptation of, um, of fireproofing in Tom Leslie's talk um, in a few minutes. Uh, but fire is, um, one of the formulating ideas and conditions um, that both drive skyscraper technology adaptations um, and also change the nature of cities, um, as Don Friedman will, uh, will introduce to us and frame um, in his discussion of the various urban conf conflagrations. So um, in exploring this idea of fire, uh, we'll, we'll end uh, the four and a half to six hour uh, time frame of our, uh, of our full semester worth of investigations by uh, Tom Leslie and, and Don Friedman. And we also have with us uh, tonight Alexander Wood, who will be the commentator um, and the questioner for the the Q&A after the two presentations. Um, and Alex will also join us next week in his featured talk on the Mills Building um, in New York, a building of the early 1880s in which a, a, a case study kind of brings together many of the issues that we've already discussed in terms of building culture um, in, the, in the cities, but also introduces um, important ideas about labor, um, economic, uh, 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 crises um, in New York and the adaptation of, of business buildings. So um, I will introduce Alex just before he comes on in order to be the moderator and after Tom and Don's presentations. Um, but let me first show you um, a couple of slides that will remind you from last times um, if you've been following the whole series. And by the way, if you haven't, have you missed any of the talk, excellent talks, um, you will be able to find them either on our website or the Skyscraper Museum's YouTube channel. Uh, and indeed, we are being live streamed now. So if you need to leave this program, which is now, you know, will we'll shortly be full to our 100 maximum. If you have to leave, you, um, you can uh, catch up on our YouTube channel uh, with the live stream um, at any point and where it's archived as well until it's in its edited version. So this is an overview slide of the whole series. Uh, and uh, as you've seen numerous times before, in fact, three times before, the two covers of the kind of classic um, iconic works on New York and Chicago um, by our two speakers. Uh, and I did want to mention that um, Don Friedman will be uh, traveling to the, uh, the, the, the second city, Chicago, next week. Uh, to give a talk in person live uh, for the AIA and for um, APT, the Association of Preservation Technology International, um, on, as you can see on his uh, kind of promo page on the, from the AIA's website, uh, a free lecture. Uh, and uh, it is on uh, Thursday um, of, this, uh, of next week, uh, April 28th. Uh, in the meantime, you will come back, I hope, next Tuesday uh, for Alex Wood's talk on the Mills Building. And just by um, way of uh, a bit of background on some of the writings where you can find uh, in digital publications on platform and in, here at the Gotham Center and a couple of articles there, uh, as well as in other places, the kind of um, first chapters of a book that he is now uh, indeed writing as a, at a fellow um, as a fellow at the New York Historical Society where he's turning his dissertation of about two years ago now which he completed at uh, Columbia GSAP uh, on the called um, titled uh, building the metropolis architecture building and labor in New York City from 1890 to 1935 so you can see that his uh, research and investigations uh, fall exactly um, in the within the, the, the time frame that we have been exploring for the early skyscraper. Um, I did too want to mention uh, 
an important book in the area that we're looking at tonight. Uh, and it was written 20 years ago by Sarah Vermeil uh, and on Fireproof Building, where she makes um, the modest argument in a very definitive book that um, this is a book that uh, is about the, the success of the building industry addressing the issue of fireproof building, which then became a non-issue essentially in the scholarship because uh, the problems were solved. Of course, the problems are many and they're not entirely solved and fire remain and other, other um, threats um, to building structure remain key problems for uh, architects and, uh, and engineers to deal with and with cities uh, to adjust to. And it's those topics of the, the situation as contingent um, issues of fire that Don Friedman and Tom Leslie are gonna take us through tonight. So um, I end this section of the introduction with a question mark so um, I can remember to tell you to put your any questions that you have in the chat. Uh, and that I hope you will respond to um, after next week or so, a survey that we send around to find out how many of the programs you've listened to, other topics that you would like to have addressed. And indeed, if you would like to suggest topics for further um, exploration in virtual programs, we're very interested to hear that um, because we've decided that in, in a kind of summary session, we want to let these ideas gestate a bit and, um, and come back for a roundtable discussion sometime more towards the summer where um, as questions have been posed, as thoughts have further matured, we can bring all the speakers, um, all of the moderators together in order to try to, um, to, to you know, uh, tease out larger questions in a more meta-narrative to counter the, the kind of um, simplistic um, narratives that had been crafted around the idea of modernism um, that we have been demolishing um, through the four sessions of the talk so far. Um, so with that, let me invite um, Don Freeman to turn his video uh, on and to um, introduce us to the history of, um, of uh, fires in cities and especially how New York reacted. Thank you, Carol. Um, I, I, every time I, I get to this topic in a public forum, I always feel it necessary to say that, uh, consider this right now to be a content warning. Um, I'm not going to be showing anything particularly gruesome, but it is a very unpleasant topic in a way. Uh, so I, uh, unlike, unlike our three previous topics where we were talking about um, good things. Um, so just that's, that's where I wanna start. Uh, one other uh, sort of general comment and uh, Sarah Vermeil's book uh, leads to this. Uh, the word fireproof isn't really used as a, as a noun or an adjective anymore. Um, it is used as a verb. We say that we're, we are fireproofing the structure. Uh, but the reason it has fallen out of use um, in the other forms is that there is really no such thing as a fireproof building. Uh, that's a modern usage. And in the era that um, I'm going to be talking about, which is the 1870s to the 19 teens, people did talk about fireproof buildings. So I'm going to be using the word in the sense that people would have used it at that time. Um, if, you, if you talk about uh, fires that have influenced the way we build, I think a lot of people immediately jump to something like the, the Chicago fire, which pretty much everyone has heard of in 1871. Um, that is one of a fairly long list of large fires, large multi-building fires, often uh, covering very large areas. Uh, I, I put up, the, this, is, this is some of the biggest of them. Um, there's a couple of things about this list that I think are interesting. Uh, the first one is San Francisco has an asterisk uh, because most people, if you say San Francisco 1906, they say, oh, the big earthquake. Um, and it was a very large earthquake. It also, there was also a fire that began as a result of the earthquake or actually multiple fires. Um, and in terms of damage done to the city, the fires were maybe pretty close to the amount of, of uh, damage caused by the earthquake. Um, so while we all think of, of that as an earthquake, it was an earthquake and fire. 
Uh, the other thing that should be sort of jump out at you about this list is that New York City does not have any large scale fires of that type after 1845. Um, and in 1845, New York consisted of buildings that had masonry exterior walls and wood interiors. That, that's what everything was in the city at that time. Uh, and fires in, in cities built like that go back to antiquity, go back actually probably to prehistory. So the fact that New York did not have any, any of these large multi-building fires uh, later in the 19th century, um, I think has some effect on how, on how people in New York saw things. Uh, a topic that we've discussed amongst ourselves is, is the issue of local versus national. And very large fires um, are national news and have a national effect. So a lot of what took place in New York in the late 19th century was a result of, the, of two of the fires on this list, uh, specifically the Chicago fire in 1871, the famous one, and the Boston fire in 1872. Um, for very simple statistics about those two fires, uh, if you look at this, the Chicago fire was bigger by every standard that you might wanna compare. Um, the Chicago fire, destroyed a large percentage of the built up area of the city. Um, the Boston fire was a relatively small area of the, of the downtown, actually the financial district of the city. Um, one thing, if you if you're, want to do a little bit of division, um, Chicago lost uh, more than 20 times as many buildings as Boston did, but the calculated losses were only three times as big. And that, that suggests something. So. What's, what's the city of Chicago in 1871? It's a boom town. Um, it was a, a very rapidly growing city that was about 40 years old. And a large percentage of the buildings that were destroyed were um, one or two story wood frame houses and similar sized small commercial buildings. Again, all wood construction. Uh, so they burned easily uh, and they added to this, to this huge total. Um, but a lot of them weren't insured. Um, and therefore, it's not that that doesn't mean that they matter. It means that it didn't enter into the calculations. Somebody lost their house. That's a terrible thing. But it didn't have a, a larger economic implication necessarily. Whereas the buildings that were lost in Boston were large commercial buildings, a lot of them office buildings. Uh, both the buildings and their contents were insured. Um, so if you look at what happens with the insurance companies after the Chicago fire, a number of lo small local insurance companies in the Chicago area went bankrupt because they paid out on uh, buildings in, in the center of the city. Um, after the Boston fire, uh, that was a national problem for insurance companies. And um, they, they sort of set out to say, how do we prevent this from happening again? And you get a number of uh, insurance, company, insurance companies joining together in various ways after the Boston fire that they did not after the Chicago fire and they had not previously. Um, they started doing research together. Um, the Underwriters Laboratory, which exists to this day, grows out of this, this movement of the insurance companies after the Boston fire uh, to, to make cities less flammable so that they didn't have to pay out on their policies. Um, and one way that they could influence this was uh, refusing to cover a building if it was considered to be of dangerous construction or charging much higher rates for buildings that were of dangerous or more flammable construction. So the fact that insurance companies got very interested in this topic after 1872 is not a negligible thing. It has a national effect. That said, what I wanna do is discuss a number of local fires in New York City um, and the way in the context of what took place in Boston, how people interpreted what happened at these fires. In other words, um, people, learn from, people learn from mistakes, people learn from disasters, uh, but they can only learn a lesson that they, are, that they have a context to understand. Uh, so how they saw a building in 1872 or in 1899, as I'm about to talk about, uh, was related to how they understood the effects of fire. The Windsor Hotel uh, was on Fifth Avenue between, I think, I forget if it's 44th and 45th Streets or 45th and 46th. Um, so that's a full block front there. 
uh, it's 20, 000, it was 20,000 square feet per floor, seven stories tall. This is a big building. Um, the exterior was a masonry wall. Uh, pretty much the entire interior was wood. And when I talk about this building in, uh, to a modern audience, it sounds insane. Uh, the Windsor Hotel, as a sort of a luxury hotel, had elevators. Uh, it was, by the way, it was built in 1873, and I'll come back to that in a second. It had elevators. Um, the elevator shafts were wood framed. It had dumb waiters to uh, provide services to people on the upper floors, um, room service, cleaning, things like that. The dumb waiter shafts were wood. Uh, it had wood stairwells. Everything in this building could burn, basically, except for the walls. Um, you can't build a building like that today. We consider it to be unsafe. Well, in 1873, when this building was built, there really weren't a whole lot of options. People knew how to build a fireproof building, um, but it was incredibly difficult. They were using brick vaults supported by wrought iron beams. Uh, it was an enormously heavy, expensive floor. To, be simply, to put it simply, it was not economical to build this hotel if you had to build it in a fireproof manner. And it was not required by the building laws at the time because again, in the early 1870s, everything was built that way. So it was, it was built in accordance with the standards of its time. When it burned down 26 years later, it was seen as a fire trap, uh, not before it burned, after it burned. And actually after it burned, there was a, uh, this soul searching in New York City about uh, how many of our hotels are fire traps because no one had considered the Windsor to be dangerous before it burned. This is the day after the fire. So you go from, from that to that in the space of a day. Um, the fire burned out the insides completely and the exterior walls collapsed. That's what happens in the building of this type when it burns. It, the, the reports are that it burned in less than an hour but it appears that the peak of the fire from when it was first known that the building was on fire um, until the, uh, the interior was gutted was actually on more on the order of half an hour. And again, we don't see buildings burn like that today. We have too many fire protection systems in place for a building to burn like that today. So this is, you have to put yourself in the mindset of people in the 19th century. This was not an uncommon thing for a building to burn like that. I'm using this building as an example, but there were any number of them. So what did people learn from this, from, from uh, you know, 80 people dying, a building being destroyed? What did they learn from this, from this happening? Well, what they learned was that a building that was built before the 1882 code in New York, which was the one that first introduced fireproof structure, that those buildings were dangerous. That was true, and it was not a bad lesson, but it's very limited. Um, in other words, it was a building that by the standards of, of, of 1899 was considered to be unsafe. And what they got was a lesson that that building was unsafe. Uh, true, but not very useful. Um, some, a few years earlier. So the, the, in the 1870s, people were still building these flammable buildings in New York. Uh, the 1882 building code um, started to require require fireproof structure for certain, for certain buildings of certain types. Um, the, the building that occupies most of, this, most of this photograph is the Manhattan Savings Bank building. Um, and it was fireproofed in what was considered to, it was fireproof in the standards of its construction era, which is that it didn't contain flammable structure. Uh, it had terracotta tile arch floors, which I believe Tom will be talking about a bit wrought iron structure, uh, masonry walls. There was nothing that could burn other than <clears throat> in the structure itself, other than the windows, or the window frames. Well, how did it get to be so bad? I mean, you, as you can see, a large portion of the building actually collapsed, um, not just where the street facade is missing, but to the, the left of that, you, you're looking through the windows at the sky, which is an indication that the interior structure has collapsed. Um, the collapses took place because none of the, or not none of it, but a lot of the interior metal structure was not fireproofed. In other words, there was, ex there was exposed wrought iron, there was exposed cast iron in this building, um, and they were not flammable, but metal expands in, in when it gets hot, and fire, uh, structural fire will generate 
uh, very high temperatures, uh, well above 2000 degrees is, is, not, is not unheard of. Um, and as the columns expanded, they pushed the girders off of the seated connections they had. Um, so this, is, this building was destroyed by the effect of the heat, um, not because it actually burned. But that's not really the interesting part of the story of this building. Um, the interesting part is the ruin that you see on the, on the far right, on, on the lower right corner. That was a different building. That's the Keep building. And that's actually where the fire started. Fire did not start in the Manhattan Savings Bank. Um, the fire started in the Keep Building, which was an old-fashioned building, wood structure, mason exterior walls, uh, jumped across the street, and then destroyed the, the, the uh, Manhattan Bank, the Manhattan Savings Bank building. So th there was actually there were actually two important lessons here. One of which was well known, which is that fire can spread even across a 50-foot wide street. Uh, but the second lesson was was a more important one. Um, the use of non-flammable structure does not mean that your building is fireproof. And that was a lesson that was taught again and again in the 19th century, and people eventually caught on to it. Um, one of the issues is what, what form of fireproofing would work properly. Um, the Manhattan Savings Bank had uh, actually exposed metal, so it, it had um, none in some, no, no fireproofing in some areas, again, but considered to be a fireproof building because it was because it was not flammable. Um, the home life insurance building, and this is New York's home life insurance building as opposed to the more famous one in Chicago, uh, is the tall building with the very steep hip roof. Um, if you look at the building, the photograph on the right, the, the building to the left of the hip roof is the Postal Telegraph building. Those are two separate buildings built more or less simultaneously. And as you can see, the floors line up um, so they're, they're, for a lot of angles, they look like they're one building, but they're not. Um, in the picture on the left, uh, you see a, uh, a five-story building with, with a bunch of canvas awnings right next door to home insurance. And then the picture on the right, that building is gone. Uh, that building was the Rogers Pete, uh, it was men's department store, basically. Um, and it was, a, again, an older building. I think it was from the 1850s or 60s. <clears throat> Uh, it burned very quickly. It burned in the space of about half an hour um, and was completely destroyed, as you can see in the picture on the right. Well, heat rises. And as, as you can see in both of these pictures, there were windows on the lot line of the, uh, of the home insurance building and fire spread through those windows to the interior of the, of the home insurance building, which at that time was very new. It, was, uh, it had only been open for a couple of years. Um, it's sort of an interesting question as to whether or not this is a good outcome or a bad outcome. One way of looking at this is that the fire, the structural fireproofing worked and the home insurance building was not only structurally pretty much intact, um, it was repaired and is there to this day. It's now a New York City landmark. Uh, and it's difficult to tell the difference between the way it appears today and the way it appears in, in the photograph on the left, um, which is from, uh, from early 1898, I believe. Um, so this, the structural fireproofing work. You notice the scare quotes around the word fireproof in the captions of these two photographs. These photographs are from a book about fireproofing buildings put out by an insurance company. And their point was that the building itself did not collapse, but the insurance company would have to pay out on the contents. Uh, and therefore, this was not a successful structural fireproofing. Um, there, there, well, I mean, one lesson here is that the, the uh, Rogers Pete department store was not fireproof and it burned very quickly. Uh, I'm not sure they learned the other lesson correctly. So th there is, you have a tall fireproof building next to a short unfireproof building. The tall building is vulnerable to the effects of fire, but it survived. And that, that's, that should be given a great deal of weight. Um, had the home insurance building collapsed, things would be much worse. Uh, or had it burned to the point where the structure above the, the fifth or sixth floor was no longer viable, that would have been much worse. Um, this event with, a, with a, a low flammable building and a taller fireproof building happened again and again in New York in the 1880s, 90s, into the 20th century. I picked this one because it happens to have a good before and after picture. But this was a common phenomenon 
And it took a while for people to, to say, well, how do we stop this from happening? One thing that, that did uh, happen is that lot line windows had to be fire rated. And it is difficult to fire rate a glass window. Um, you, you can get a great deal better performance by, put, by using wired glass, uh, where there's actually glass in the, uh, uh, something that looks like chicken wire in the glass. Um, but if you look at the, the lot line walls of a lot of tall buildings of that era, um, the ones after around 1900 typically don't have windows, and it is in part a reaction to this kind of fire. But similar to uh, home insurance performing well, I want I want to just come closer to the present for a minute. Um, this is the West Street building, otherwise known as 90 West Street. Uh, on September 11th, 2001, when the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed, flaming debris hit this hit the north facade of this building, which is the one we're looking at, at at least four locations uh, that I know of. Um, I, I had the uh, pleasure of inspecting this building on the on the 12th. Um, because of the disruption uh, to the New York City Fire Department, um, the, fighting the fires in this building took much longer than it ordinarily would have. Uh, among other things, there were, uh, the events of September 11th knocked out the water mains in the area. So it took a while to get a supply of water to even begin to fight this fire. Um, so the, the interior at a number of floors was on fire for something on the order of eight or nine hours. Uh, what's interesting is that there was almost no structural damage. Um, there were a few small columns up in the highest floors. Uh, there's a mansard roof, which you can't really see in this photograph, uh, that, that buckled from the heat. Uh, and uh, obviously there were a few spandrel beams that were damaged where debris uh, hit the north facade. But the basic structure of the building, the steel frame, the terracotta tile arch floors, was all, was all intact, even on the floors where the, the contents burned out. So. This was a, a much more recent reminder of how good fireproofing was. Um, this building was built in 1905. Uh, the, the, the fire, going from just using non-flammable materials to protecting all of the metal with terracotta, which is what took place in the 1890s, um, worked very well. The terracotta fireproofing worked very well. Uh, so by modern standards, by standards of the, the 21st century, um, 1900 eras fireproofing, if it's built the way that they intended to build it, actually works pretty well. Um, so uh, one of my citywide fires was Baltimore. Oh, that should actually be 1904, excuse me. Uh, that is a mistake in the title. Um, th this was, again, this was similar to the Boston fire. It was the, the downtown area of the city that burned. and. Uh, there was a, a great deal of forensic investigation of the various, uh, of the performance of various buildings. People were comparing different forms of fireproofing to see what worked and what didn't. Um, the Continental Trust uh, building, which this is, this is, Continental Trust was an insurance company. This is uh, their building here after the fire, uh, the front facade on the left, the rear facade on the right. Um, this was a uh, building designed by, by uh, Daniel Burnham. And not only did it get the regular forensic report, but Burnham himself went to Chicago to see, uh, went to Baltimore to see how the building had performed in the fire. Um, his report said that the building performed exceedingly well, uh, and that all that was uh, all, all that was damaged was the exterior, was the exterior and the interior. In other words, the structure performed and was reusable. Um, the contents were destroyed, and a portion of the exterior facades were destroyed. Uh, the um, insurance report, which is what these photographs were taken from, said the same thing, but in a, uh, a more skeptical tone. Um, they weren't sure it, it made sense to save this building. And the, to jump ahead, it was, it was repaired and is still standing today. Uh, this is an example of the kind of damage that Burnham basically shrugged off and the insurance company uh, investigators were not so sure about. Um, what you can see here, you're looking directly at the steel spandrel beams uh, in two locations. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but here and here. Uh, the, the, the masonry curtain wall, the facade has sloughed off uh, from the effect of the heat. And those mullions you're seeing are cast iron. They've buckled from the effect of the heat. 
Um, so the, the facade in this area, and this is the rear facade, was pretty well destroyed. Um, Burnham's point was that it was cheaper and easier to rebuild the building using the intact steel frame than it was to build a new building. Uh, the insurance company sort of grudgingly uh, accepted that logic and said something similar. But it, it raises this question of, of are you better off um, having a, a damaged building that has to be rebuilt or having an empty lot and uh, having to build everything from scratch. Um, the, the other thing about this particular slide is the concept that the masonry, that the masonry wall was sacrificial, uh, which is certainly not how Burnham would have described it, but it's how it performed. The masonry wall absorbed the heat and fell apart as a result, and in the process saved the steel frame behind it. Uh, the Parker building was on what was then called 4th Avenue. It's now called uh, Park Avenue South. Um, and it was an industrial loft building uh, built in 1900. Somewhat backward looking structure, uh, it had cast iron columns um, and the, uh, the lateral stability of the building came from the masonry wall. <clears throat> but it was, it was supposed to be fireproof to modern standards. The standards that I've just said worked very well at, uh, at West Street and Home Insurance. Um, as you can see, uh, again, we're seeing sky through the windows uh, and, and the uh, plan on the right, um, pretty good section of floor collapsed at every floor. Um, that's, not, that's not good. That's not what you wanna see in the fireproof building. Uh, and the question is, why did, that, why did this happen? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the short answer is the intent on fireproofing at Parker Building, which was a because it was an industrial building, a lot of money was not spent in the construction. The intent of fireproofing did not match the actual, the actual uh, result. Um, electrical conduit was cut into the terracotta fireproofing for the columns, for example. And that meant that there was a route for heat to get straight to the columns. Uh, that is the result, that it, it takes well past 2000 degrees Fahrenheit to bend cast iron in that manner. Um, that is not something you see all the time. So this is uh, the, a portion of the interior after the fire. Um, and that dam that's the kind of damage that is directly related to uh, improper use of fireproofing. Uh, here is a, a wider picture of, of the floor showing you part of the collapse. You can see some of the steel beams are bent um, and you can see actually on the column that's closest to us on the right side up at the top, um, there is a fixture mounted to the terracotta and that's the kind of thing that damaged the fireproofing. So the, the lesson here is that the fireproofing worked if you did it properly. Um, if you didn't, it was just as bad as not having fireproofing. The Parker building had to be demolished um, because replacing half of the columns in the building was simply not economically feasible compared to demolishing it and building a new building. The place that this story that I'm telling ends is the, the a building, uh, believe it or not, named the Ash Building, uh, which is where the Triangle Shirtwaist Company was located. Uh, the Ash Building was also built in 1900, um, a very similar structure to the Parker Building, actually. Uh, cast iron columns, um, exterior wall that provide lateral stability. It was better built than the Parker Building. Uh, it, it, the fireproofing in, in the Ash Building worked. Um, and given that 140 people died, that may sound sort of bizarre, but the thing is that this horrible fire, which lasted less than 30 minutes and killed all of those people, did not really damage the structure of the building. Uh, as a matter of fact, the building was back in operation in just a few days. Um, they had to clean all of this debris out. They had to repair a damaged fire escape, uh, damaged doors on the, uh, on the fire stairs, but there was no structural damage to be repaired. Um, so again, the structural fireproofing works. This is proof of it. But there's a second lesson here. Protecting the building beautifully well did not protect the occupants. And that upended the logic. We're, we're talking uh, 1911. This is 40 continuous years of people looking for better and better ways to fireproof the structure. And what the Triangle Fire showed was that doing that wasn't necessarily good enough. Um, just to give you a sense of this, if you look at the last edition of the New York City Building Code uh, prior to the Triangle Fire, um, there was literally one paragraph about egress stairs. There were, there were four paragraphs about egress as a whole. 
uh, it was about half a page. The 1916 code, which is the first major revision after the fire, has paragraph after paragraph, very detailed descriptions of the minimum stair width, how the stair enclosure is to be built, and so on. In other words, that doesn't, they're spending their time not on how to protect the building, but on how to protect people. And that's a very big change in focus. It's a very big change in just thinking about the topic of fire as a whole. Uh, and it's the change that we're still living with today. Our current codes are based on protecting occupants, which includes protecting the building, but it's not only protecting the building. The Triangle Fire is the, the inflection point where, where this thing changed. Um, and it, it really is a, a, just a different outlook. Uh, the, after, after 1968 in New York, the fire codes became much less restrictive uh, on building fireproofing. And I think Tom is going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and that, that, that happened because the portion of the code that, that relates to protecting people had gotten so much more involved, so much more detailed, that the portion of fire protection involving protecting the building was no longer needed to be as, as comprehensive. Um, so that's sort of just a, a walk through some of these fires. Um, there are literally hundreds of similar fires that I could talk about. I use these examples because they're clear cut and I think that they present the, the concepts well. I'm gonna stop now and Tom can uh, give a different perspective. Different indeed, thanks Don. Um, Don uh, won the, the coin toss and got to show most of the lurid slides. I'll just start with this, which is the aftermath of Chicago in 1871. And to Don's point, you can see that there are a number of different building types here, all of which performed equally poorly, all of them called fireproof. And very quickly, you would think the lesson would have been learned that uh, timber in dense, tall building construction was a, was a bad material. But famously, uh, Chicago did not, in fact, impose a new building code right after the 1871 fire. In fact, most of what was built in its wake was exactly what had been there before. Uh, if you were a building owner, you just wanted to build as quickly as you could and recover. There was no real effort at, at sort of stepping back and thinking, you know, could we do this any better? Uh, Chicago's building code movement really only took off after 1874 when another fire, uh, this one around Polk Street, threatened to, to burn the city uh, again. As Don alluded to, and as, as Sarah's book uh, talks about in great detail, uh, one of the, the best solutions was an entrepreneurial one. What did happen after 1871 was that you had hundreds of people coming to Chicago uh, marketing fireproof building systems and, and fireproof, of course, always uh, now in hindsight, always in quotes. But the idea that that really uh, took hold and that proved to be reasonably successful uh, was terracotta fireproofing, this idea that you could both insulate uh, the, the vulnerable iron from the heat uh, and flame of a fire uh, and also protect it from uh, debris and things with a, with a terracotta jacket. And that by building floors out of these flat, hollow terracotta arches, you provided a, a fire, you could provide a fireproof barrier between one floor and another. And this is the, the principle of containment where you're not only protecting the vulnerable uh, ironwork, but you're trying as best you can to keep the fire from spreading from, from floor to floor. Uh, at least through the through the structural system. So these were reasonably successful and there's a, a fairly uh, traceable evolution that uh, Joseph Freetag's uh, book on fireproofing goes through that shows these solutions beginning really with brick arches in the 1870s uh, and progressing through uh, a series of uh, very different uh, designs, all of them patented, all of them with subtle differences that made them uniquely marketable. Uh, and you can see some names that maybe are familiar. George Johnson, who was the, the founder of the Pioneer Fireproofing uh, uh, Company, and White, who was Peter Bonnet White, a, a New York architect who emigrated to Chicago literally after seeing a, a newspaper headline that Chicago had burned and realizing that there was a market uh, for, this, for this new idea of, of terracotta fireproofing. Um, but what, there are a couple of things that are interesting about this progression. Now, one is that the, the one thing that is consistent in all, two things, 
There are, of course, iron beams uh, vulnerable to, to heat and therefore in need of insulation and protection. Uh, but on top of all of these uh, systems, uh, except one, except the Montauk block, you can see that there is concrete poured as, as the sort of finished uh, slab above. And this, as uh, Don and I were talking earlier, concrete is a, a new material in the 1870s, but it's one that builders gradually become more comfortable with. And you can imagine it almost sort of beginning to take over that more and more of the, of the fireproofing system uh, is going to be of this, uh, of this relatively new or newly rediscovered uh, material. Terracotta, though, remained the, the uh, primary, uh, primary uh, way to fireproof iron structures well uh, past the, 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 uh, the turn of the century. There were, however, problems uh, even locally in Chicago or incidents that, that made people question whether this was really the best solution or not. And, and maybe the most dramatic example of this was the Chicago Athletic Association, which was uh, constructed in 1892, 1893, and which burned just before it was due to open uh, in November, 1892. The results of the fire were that the, the building structure remained intact, uh, but the contents, mostly construction uh, materials and debris, something like 80,000 linear feet of oak flooring uh, is what started the, the blaze. Um, all of the contents were destroyed though, and, and the fire threatened to spread to, to other uh, neighboring structures. And the two reactions, much like the Burnham building in Baltimore, depended on whether you were a, a, a terracotta fireproof uh, entrepreneur or an architect, uh, or whether you were a, a concerned citizen. And the lesson learned here, or at least by some, was that, as Don said, protecting the fire, the, the structure, uh, only left you with a, a structure and that the contents uh, were certainly uh, capable of burning and, and very often did. Those contents, of course, include occupants and uh, the one uh, thing that, that the fireproofing of, the, of iron didn't really do was either help get the occupants out or, or give them a, a, a safe, safe, place to, um, safe place to go. So we see that the, there are a couple of things going on. One is, as Don said, the move from uh, just fireproofing the structure to thinking about how to better take care of, of the contents and occupants of a, of a building. And the other thing that we see is an effort, not just because of the Athletic Association fire, but because of this series of fires and the growing uh, com comfort level with concrete, we begin to see concrete uh, floor systems come in and, and take the place of terracotta. There are a couple of key moments in this. One is a series of tests that the city of New York runs on fireproofing systems. And they find that concrete systems perform uh, just about as well as terracotta. Concerns about the iron expanding, uh, contracting differently from concrete proved to be unfounded. The fact that uh, iron or, or steel and concrete have relatively similar thermal coefficients of expansion is really fortunate uh, for those of us who, who design and work on buildings because it means that reinforced concrete is, is a possibility. And here you see a number of patented systems that use either a concrete alone to protect the iron or uh, concrete in conjunction with gypsum block, which is another popular uh, fireproofing material that you see uh, in 1898. Concrete has several advantages. One of them is that it itself is structural, so it contributes to the, the strength and the stability of a, of a structural frame. Uh, the other is that you're eliminating one trade in the construction process. Uh, the terracotta blocks were laid by uh, bricklayers and masons. And particularly in the 1890s, bricklayers were uh, in Chicago were very active. They were strike prone and relatively expensive being skilled labor. So the idea that you could sort of move the bricklayers to the side and deal more with carpenters and the unskilled labor that could actually pour uh, concrete into those forms was probably very attractive uh, in 1890s Chicago. And we see concrete spreading really as a constructive system right around 1900, the, the first Reinforced concrete skyscraper is generally agreed to be this one in Cincinnati, Ohio, which comes along in 1905. As with everything else, it depends on what your definition of first and concrete and skyscraper is. But this is a, a pretty notable achievement of a building frame entirely of reinforced concrete. And you can see that the floors are now contiguous with the structure itself. So the terracotta has completely disappeared. And there's now one material that's building the entire structural frame.
Um, this takes hold in Chicago slowly, but uh, importantly. Chicago is a, a steel city, but it certainly is also one to, to, to recognize a good idea when it sees it. And concrete begins to be used first in industrial uh, situations, which is understandable. That's a place where you want a fast, cheap construction that's very strong and that is certainly fireproof. So here, um, I, I think maybe the first uh, reinforced concrete multi-story building in Chicago, the Winton building, which is only built three stories, but is designed originally for, uh, for four or five. And then a building that I think is really underrated uh, in the history of uh, construction, the Studebaker building by these two engineers, Condren and Sinks, who develop what they claim is the first uh, basically flat slab construction. And it's certainly very, very early flat slab construction where they're basically eliminating the dropped girders that you get in typical concrete construction you see the comparison on the right, but also eliminating the need for iron or steel at all. So once again, eliminating a trade basically from the construction site, eliminating the coordination that goes with it and sticking with a more or less uh, single material for the, for the majority of the, of the building structure. So concrete proves itself uh, to be the equal of terracotta uh, in a number of fires, Baltimore included. But at the same time, there are changes to the code that begin to make fireproof materials less and less uh, important and make other aspects of fire safety uh, more critical to, to architectural design in particular. And maybe the most significant of these, and one that has little architectural consequence, so probably not uh, covered adequately in, in typical architectural histories, is the idea of just of just suppressing the fire altogether, right? Of, of worrying less about whether the structure is protected and worrying more about uh, actually putting the fire out and preserving the contents, the occupants, and along with it, the, the building structure. So there's a parallel history here where figures like Parmalee and, and Frederick Grinnell uh, develop and patent workable systems of uh, sprinklers, act, actual active suppression. Uh, that relies on fusible links to set off uh, valves that will flood uh, a, a conflagration with water from uh, pipes that are actively filled with, with pressurized, uh, pressurized water from tanks. And on the right, you see uh, an advertising brochure from Grinnell. When the fire starts, the water starts. And the idea that timber buildings, and they have a, a particularly a compelling campaign about timber schools, uh, Grinnell doesn't propose rebuilding the schools out of a fireproof material. What Grinnell proposes instead, cleverly, is that you come into these timber buildings and you install Grinnell automatic fire sprinklers, which mean that the, the material uh, itself is actually less effective, or the, the material itself is less uh, impactful yeah, in the way that the, the fire is controlled. So it's a, a combination of, of this move toward other materials and also a change in emphasis to suppression and containment uh, that, that begins to really change the building code, which begins to then change the, the way buildings are constructed. Um, codes are local, and so they're different in every city, but in every case, they respond not only to the innovations that Don and I are talking about, uh, but also to the, the sort of balance of power between developers and laborers and the, the kind of public's concern for, uh, for safety. So we see codes kind of move slowly. They, are, they adopt concrete, uh, but only after uh, concrete is sort of proven in fire situations. Um, and by the, the 20s and 30s, we see uh, activism toward uh, making codes more responsive to technologies that are coming online and also more responsive to the sort of changing balances that we see uh, politically in cities all across the country. Um, Carol's given me permission to sort of jump chronologically. And I, I wanna, to close, I wanna talk about a very specific uh, incident, a very specific code change in Chicago uh, that happened in the late 1940s, early 1950s. This is beyond the, the sort of scope of time that we've been talking about previously, but it's new research that I've done, and I think it, it throws into light the, the way that codes are written. We sometimes think they're sort of handed down and they always reflect the, the very latest in technology and, and building science. In fact, they are political documents, and I wanna show how that plays out. By the uh, 1940s, uh, and particularly the, the kind of post-war uh, building boom, uh, both the federal government and developer agencies 
for developer um, uh, uh, organizations are beginning to agitate for more responsive uh, building codes. And this is a, a, a pamphlet that's published by the sort of quasi-governmental National Committee on Housing. Um, this is a group of professionals, industry uh, people, who realize that the United States is gonna have to build a lot more housing with the, the boom that's coming after, after World War II, and that it's not gonna be able to do that economically given the state of building codes, many of which had been written in the teens and 20s, many of which still relied on the, the kind of mindset uh, that, that had existed then that, that dealt more with fireproofing structure uh, and less with, with the new technologies like sprinklers, uh, et cetera. Um, Chicago certainly had one of these. Uh, as late as 1941, uh, the, the rewriting of the code included what are called prescriptive elements. So this is a, a philosophy of building code writing that says that the, the city can tell you exactly what you need to build your building out of. So we get clauses like this at the top uh, where it says the structural frame shall be of, and then it gives you a list of acceptable uh, materials. Um, you can see that there's still, uh, they, they still understand the, um, the, the, the sort of basic principle of, of terracotta construction. All metal members of the structural frame shall be protected by coverings of fire resistant values required by the chapter, blah, blah, blah. And then later on, they will tell you exactly what those materials have to be. So the second clause there, 6814, talks about uh, partitions or walls that are gonna contain fires. And instead of saying, you know, use a material that's gonna contain the, the fire for such and such amount of time, they say, if we tell you it has to be a four hour wall, these are the only acceptable materials uh, that you can make it out of. So there's a lot of innovation that's been going on. And to get that innovation into the code in Chicago, you actually have to have the city council rewrite a clause in the code, which means that you're relying immediately on your, your ability to get things through the, the city's political system, always uh, a, a bit of an issue. And this uh, uh, turns out affects uh, building design uh, in, in a number of ways. Here's a clause down at the bottom that uh, I'm gonna come back to in a little bit that, that tells you not only the, the materials that you can use, but actually the configuration of a building element itself. If you are building a, a window in a non-combustible wall, which is essentially any wall in a tall building in particular, um, you have to have a sill in what's called a spandrel wall, a wall that sticks up from the floor slab. Uh, that's a two hour construction for three feet between the top of one window and the bottom of another. So it's telling you right there that you can't have an all glass facade, right? You have to have a, a spandrel wall. The idea here is that you're worried about fire coming out of one window, reversing course and, and coming back into the other, not inconsiderable uh, concern, but one that increasingly is, is less and less common as more buildings are sprinklered, more buildings are of fireproof construction. You get this sort of uh, almost like herd immunity in downtowns as more and more buildings become safer and safer. So Chicago is one of the first cities to begin to think about not just rewriting its code, but completely reformulating its philosophy to building codes and to fire safety. Uh, they hired John Merrill uh, of Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, who is an expert in housing. And beginning in 1946, uh, Merrill leads a commission that is going to reform the building code. And in particular, to base the new code on what are called standards of performance. In other words, to eliminate any specific references to terracotta or concrete uh, or brick, and to instead simply say that the, the onus is on the, the, the builders and the owners to prove that what they're gonna build the wall out of is gonna last in a fire as, as long as, as we say it is, or as long as we say it, it has to. And this does a couple of things. One, it means that technology is instantly available to go on site if, and this is the other thing, you can have it laboratory tested to show that it actually works. And Underwriters Laboratory is one of several companies that springs up. Underwriters is based in Chicago. Uh, they have about a 40 year history at this point, but performance-based codes are of course a boon for them because it means that they now have uh, a guaranteed market, right? Anytime there's a new material that comes online, organizations like Underwriters are gonna be asked to test that material and to see if it actually uh, meets, the, meets the performance standards. 
So, okay, this seems like it should be fine, but codes being political, you never know what's going to crop up. And one of the problems with Chicago's code in the late 40s is that very quickly the plasterers union realizes that a performance-based code could put them out of business. There is this fairly new material that's developed in the teens and 20s called drywall, gypsum drywall, uh, that doesn't require professional plasterers to put it up. It can be put up by carpenters. And the plasterers union in Chicago realizes that if performance-based codes come into being, the plaster board is going to be lab tested, it's going to be approved, and you suddenly no longer need 15 or 20 plasters spending a couple of weeks uh, putting your walls up, you can get carpenters who can come in uh, and do it in, in, in a matter of hours or days. And so sure enough, the performance-based code, as it goes through city council, uh, it starts to see weird things crop up, like uh, drywall is specifically prohibited. And it turns out that the, uh, the, the, the alderman who leads this charge, Years later, it's discovered that he uh, has had his house replastered and restuccoed for free by the plasterers union. Um, that only happens after the, the, the code sort of uh, has gone through city council. But this, I think, shows the, the kind of political influence in this case of, of labor, um, trying to make sure that the new code doesn't put them uh, out of work. Uh, there's a long story here involving wonderfully a, a kind of fist fight outside the city council chamber in Chicago. To make a long story short, uh, the code passes on New Year's Eve, uh, 1949. Um, this is the, the headline that you're really after here. Uh, the council debate, it's taken five years to get the, th or four years to get the thing uh, formulated uh, and through city council, the plasterers union among others uh, goes down to defeat, though you can see that that's the, the sort of secondary headline, right? Wallboard plaster uh, issue disputed. They are still gonna be uh, agitating and talking about how dangerous gypsum drywall is, but performance-based codes come into the city for the first time. And it's one of the first cities uh, to do so. Kansas City actually does it earlier, uh, but Chicago is one of the first cities to implement uh, performance-based standards. And this is what that looks like. There's no mention of specific materials anywhere in the 1950-51 codes uh, definitions of fire resistive construction. There's simply a table that tells you how many hours a certain component has to last. And interestingly, the spandrel requirement disappears completely too. Uh, it is replaced by a sort of long tortured chain of, of code clauses where if you read it right, you realize that exterior non-bearing walls uh, with outside exposure have to be two hour walls unless they face a street that's wide enough that you're not worried about fire uh, jumping across it, in which case they can be one hour walls. And in a one hour wall, you can have a window that is infinitely large. So assuming the building is sprinklered, assuming you're facing a street, the spandrel requirement has completely disappeared. That's like a, a minor point, but two of these uh, great Chicago monuments of the post-war era by Mies van der Rohe, the Promontory Apartment Block on the left, 1947-49 and 868-80 Lakeshore Drive on the right, show how quickly the code can change the way we think about architecture. Promontory is, is permitted in 1947, and you can see on the left, that it has one of these spandrel walls, brick that sticks up and provides that three foot uh, barrier between one window and the next. Promontory is built out of concrete. Uh, there are stories that Mies wanted to use steel but couldn't because uh, steel was still rationed uh, in 1947. Um, but concrete makes much more sense for residential construction anyway. It creates shallower floor plates, whereas steel is better for commercial construction. We can use the depth of steel uh, to hide uh, HVAC systems and things like that that we don't have so much in residential construction. But what's interesting to me here uh, in this comparison of um, sort of detail models by uh, these two students who've been working with me show um, is that facade and the fact that the, the promontory spandrel requirement means that it is always going to look like a solid building with punched windows, whereas 86880 Lakeshore Drive looks like something completely different, right? They are called the glass houses even though of course there's plenty of steel uh, on the exterior as well. And if you do the, the kind of legwork and go back into the, the building permit 
microfilms uh, in, in Chicago, what you find is that in fact, promontory, needless to say, is permitted in 1947 under the old code. 86880 Lakeshore Drive was permitted on January 20th, 1950, less than three weeks after the new code went into effect. I can't prove this, but that seems exactly enough time to pull together the drawings for a permit set uh, and run them down to City Hall. And in fact, 86880 is the first floor to ceiling uh, glass in, in high rise construction in Chicago, or really close to almost any anywhere else. You can see the advantage if you're a developer or a builder, those spandrel walls take bricklayers, a particularly thorny group of laborers, even in the 40s. Uh, and that takes time, it takes time, it takes labor. On the right, you see two people installing what would have taken a team of bricklayers a week or so, and they're doing about a floor every other day uh, with these uh, aluminum windows that they're tilting up into the, into the uh, frame. Um, one of the stories that, that Carol has asked us to come back to again and again is what was different between Chicago and New York. And here I uh, can, can risk uh, Don's wrath by pointing out that uh, our glass boxes were very different because of the way that the codes were adopted uh, in the two cities. 86880, uh, built in 1952, can be floor to ceiling glass. Uh, Lever House, New York's version of the glass box. Uh, New York still had a spandrel requirement in its code. It had not been rewritten yet. In fact, it wouldn't be written out. The spandrel requirement wouldn't be written out until 1966. So Lever House, even though it's a glass box, when you do the kind of peeling away, what you find is that there is not only one spandrel wall at every floor, but there are two, one that sticks up, one that sticks down. Uh, and Lever House is actually about uh, 40, 45% brick, facade with glass uh, in front of it. And that, again, uh, will not change for another uh, 14 years after Lever and, eight, and uh, 86880 are completed. So I will uh, end it there, uh, hopefully with a, at least a slightly provocative uh, topic. And um, I think uh, we're going to have Alexander moderate uh, our discussion. Right, so as we get Alex Wood back onto the screen um, to serve as our moderator and questioner um, for these two fascinating and, um, and incredibly informative presentations, I'll just mention um, again for anybody who joined us late that Alexander Wood is uh, a recent PhD from Columbia GSAP, the Graduate School of Architecture Planning Preservation, where he defended a dissertation with the title Building the Metropolis, Architecture, Building and Labor in New York City, 1890 to 1935. Um, he is now working on a, on a fellowship, uh, turning the dissertation and beyond into a book, uh, which is a, a funded um, position at the New York Historical Society. He is trained as an architect, first at Cooper Union, and um, then in an MArch from, uh, from MIT. So Alex is also going to uh, bring us forward with a case study next week on the Mills Building, uh, and a building from the 1880s in New York. Uh, and. Uh, flesh out uh, that decade in the many dimensions uh, of his research uh, from building cultures, construction, labor, um, and other issues. So I, um, I know I certainly want, want to encourage everybody to come back next week uh, and then to return as we all discuss the, the, the larger narratives um, in a kind of roundtable session that we plan for um, sometime in the in the next few weeks. So Alex, um, please take it over now. Hi, Carol, thank you. And uh, thank you to Don and Tom. I just have a few, a handful of questions, some of them relating to the talk, the talks this evening, some others that maybe can bring together some of the themes of the previous lectures. Uh, my first question for both of you is about uh, firefighting in skyscrapers. Um, as Don pointed out uh, with reference to the Windsor building, that's the hotel that burned down in 1899, that um, these sort of older pre-Civil War or just post-Civil War buildings, uh, once they caught fire, you know, they, you couldn't um, 
necessarily put out the fire. And if you look at the history of, for example, the New York Fire Department, a lot of their effort was spent on preventing fires from spreading, not necessarily from saving an individual building. However, as Tom and Don pointed out in the lecture, there was enormous technological improvement in fire proofing building technologies. Um, nevertheless, from my understanding, as buildings got taller and taller by the early 20th century, for example, with the Singer building or the Woolworth building or the Manhattan Municipal building in New York, for example, um, these buildings that were over 40 stories tall is that the fire department was very concerned about how it was going to fight a fire in these buildings. Um, even if there was not necessarily a threat of a fire at the Woolworth building causing all of lower Manhattan to burn down, it's, it's an enormous building. And I was wondering if both of you could speak about if in your research, you've come across any particular building technology or adaptation uh, that was made in these exceptionally tall buildings to either assist with firefighting or to um, allay the concerns of the fire departments of these cities? Well, I'll go. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. Um, there's a few things. The, the uh, technology of firefighting was moving ahead at a similar pace to the technology of buildings. So, I mean, the 19th century in New York saw uh, things go from uh, human pulled pumper engines, where, where people pulled the pumps and worked the pumps, to horse drawn pumps, to uh, 20th century, you, you start to get uh, trucks. Um, and the, the power of the pumps greatly increased uh, and so on. So, I mean, there's, there's that the firefighting equipment. Um, a lot of the effort, as you, as you say, was based not on actually putting out the fire, but on protecting neighboring buildings and particularly rescuing people. Um, if you look at uh, newspaper and magazine accounts, popular press accounts of fires in the the third and fourth quarters of the 19th century, there is a very strong focus on firefighters rescuing people from burning buildings because that's something that they could do. They couldn't necessarily put out a fire in a building like the Windsor Hotel, but they could get people out. Um, and there, there's, there's a lot of that. Uh, because that was a focus, um, and you don't even have to talk about a 40 story building. The, the, there was an enormous amount of discussion about what went wrong at the Triangle Fire. And uh, the uh, chief of the New York City Fire Department said, well, we can't get people down from the 10th floor. We don't have any way to do that. Our ladders get us up to the, the fifth or sixth floor. You know, we can extend it, maybe get to the seventh. But if you are, if you he said, if you're going to build buildings that are 10 stories tall, we cannot rescue people from those upper floors. So he was very explicitly connecting the newer, bigger buildings to that sort of 19th century mentality of the, the firefighter's job was to rescue people. Um, and just to, uh, the last thing going back to your question is, uh, I don't remember when standpipes were first required inside buildings, but it's, I think, sh shortly after 1900. And this was specifically, uh, there's no way to pump water up 30 stories uh, through a hose. But if you have a standpipe in the building, particularly if you have a wet standpipe, um, that makes it much easier for firefighters once they get to an upper floor uh, to be able to try to work on the fire at the upper floors. That, that's, I think, in terms of construction, the big uh, firefighting element that went in. Yeah, that and, and water tanks, right, which are used not only to pressurize uh, the domestic water, but often had were required to have a reserve at the bottom for a standpipe uh, or a or a sprinkler system um no one loved fire sprinklers more than the, the more than fire departments right because it it did it essentially did their job um and eliminated the need to rescue people right if the if the fire gets put out by the building itself then you know you're just there to sort of mop up um and it's interesting you know for such a such a what became a really well-tested solution. Um, sprinklers were required in some cities, but not in others. Chicago notoriously did not have an out-and-out -out sprinkler requirement until the early 2000s for, for tall buildings. Um, 
your insurance company might require you to have a, a, a sprinkler system. Um, but you know the, the the technology was there, and I, I think any fire department in the country would have said that you know their first choice would be to not have to go to a, a fire, right? To, to essentially have the building put it out itself. Uh, one, one comment is um, sprinklers are more about preventing a fire from spreading than about actually putting it out. Uh, they 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 wet all of the flammable material around the fire. They they make it spread slower, it'll burn itself out. Uh, but in general, they don't actually put out a fire, uh, particularly one, one that's got going, one that's uh, not just, you know, uh, somebody's trash can with some burning paper in it. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. Okay. Um, this, this second question, it actually relates to something that specifically came up in Tom's, uh, Tom, your lecture. Uh, uh, when you were discussing the, the development of the fireproof floor system or the, or the sort of the development of the, from the brick arch to the to the concrete floor. Um, just having done a little bit of research in this myself, I'm amazed at the, at the sort of enormous competition between all of these companies sort of incrementally improving the, the so-called fireproof floor or some type of fireproof system. And you, and you mentioned that these were often patented. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about, about that. I mean, it's, it almost seems there was an enormous demand to improve the safety of the urban environment. So it's not as if the economic self-interest of these companies drove the demand that they were s seeking to fulfill. But that seems like a new element in the American building industry in the late 19th century, these patented um, fireproof floor companies. Yeah, it, it was an enormous industry, uh, and of course, you know, we only we only take a look at the ones that succeeded, right? There were plenty that that went under, you know, whose product wasn't wasn't so great. Um, but you know, this goes back to something we were talking about right before we started, which was that you know, today we take the not not fireproof, but we take like fire safe buildings for granted, right? Like tall buildings are are just like, you know, they they very very rarely. Uh, have, have fires that um, that cause fatalities, and you know that was the exact opposite was true in the 1870s and 1880s. These buildings went up in flames all the time, right? Don has shown just like a, a small fraction of of the disasters, so it's an enormous problem, right? A really really big problem, and everyone in a in a dense city is really concerned about it because it, everyone uh, has a stake in it. So there's, there's just a market that's practically unlimited. Um, anyone who's building a new building is gonna want to claim that it's fireproof as long as that you know, word is, is, is used you know, without the kind of uh, quotes around it. Um, and so the, you know, it, it's as large a market as there can possibly be. And companies like PB White's or, or George Johnson's do enormous business because you know, if you think about the quantity of material that's going into a typical building, um, you know, that's a, that's a, a huge amount of terracotta and therefore a, a lot of money that you can make on, on one or two projects. So it is, I mean, it is one of the kind of amazing uh, industry stories of the era. And it's, it's also amazing how quickly, you know, with, with just in the space of 10 or 15 years that, that, that it disappears, right? Completely replaced by first concrete systems and then just basically concrete, right? You know, any, any, any uh, reasonably good structural concrete is accepted as a fire resistant material by you know, 1915, 1920. Actually, uh, there's a connection between this question, Tom, and your talk. Uh, one of the earliest examples of a performance requirement, um, it comes, it, it, you, you mentioned the New York testing. Uh, so what happened was that uh, New York City backed into um, testing fireproof floors uh, because they had a, a badly written clause in the building code. Uh, the 1892 building code gave you three options for a fireproof floor. Uh, you could build um, brick or stone arches, and they gave you the geometry of the arch. Nobody was building stone arches, but you, they, they had that option. You could build brick or stone arches with a very specific geometry. You could build uh, terracotta segmental vaults, so the curved terracotta floors. And again, they gave you the geometry. Or you could build 
anything that the building department approved uh, that was of similar character. And that's just, you know, <laughs> that opens the floodgates. Um, for a few years, people were coming to the building department and saying, I've got a fireproof floor. And the building department's reaction would be, that's nice. We don't have any way to, to judge your, your floor as to whether or not it is of similar performance. Um, and after, I guess, three years of this, they made a deal with uh, the Columbia University School of Mines, which is now the School of Engineering, um, to test the various floors that were coming to them. Um, and they set up a test facility on Roosevelt Island, it was Blackwell's Island then, uh, in which they had a huge, um, a huge oven and you would build a piece of, a test piece of floor and then heat it over that oven and see how it performed. And it was, it's more complicated than what I'm describing. They had a whole ser series of tests, but they all revolved around heating this, heating this floor up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was, it was a pass fail performance requirement. If you passed that test, it didn't matter how the floor worked, it was, it was acceptable for use. Uh, a lot of the patents really start going after these tests begin in 1896, because people see uh, uh, there, there's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you pass this test, you can say that my floor is good, it's a fireproof floor, and, and a government agency has approved it. Um, and I, I actually think that you know, this, several of the floors have uh, New York related names, which seem to me to be a very pathetic attempt to work the refs. Um, but the, the, these, this testing begins, when the testing begins, everybody is building terracotta tile arch floors. By the time the testing ends after about 1905, 1906, concrete is coming on very strong because as Tom said, those tests proved that the concrete floors would pass just as well as the terracotta floors. Uh, so there, it's, it's, a, it's a very weird example of a turn of the century um, performance requirement, um, not written into the code, but basically written into a gap in the code. Could I probe a little farther into um, the, the question of patents? Um, because concrete had a similar competition about trying to corner the market in columns. Uh, and, and to protect an, in, an invention and an investment uh, you know, as, as a, a future better way and to, to corner the market or you know, otherwise find a, a sales uh, pitch um, is kind of what you're both, both describing. Did patents um, protect, did they constrain, did they innovate the market um, towards a better product? What, what was the effect of patents? Hmm. Depends. <laughs> yeah, it depends, on, it depends on which side of the, which side of the equation you're on. Um, I, when you, I mean, if you go back and you look at, and this goes for any you know, patentable technology, fire sprinklers or terracotta floors or insulated glass, like whatever, if, if you go back and, and look through the patent history for you know, something that you know about, um, what you'll find is that it, it encourages innovation on a kind of tinkering scale. Like there will be patents, patent applications where someone is trying to, you know, for terracotta floors, just change the geometry slightly or, you know, change the way that it hooks on around a, 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 around a beam or something. Um, in other words, it, I think it inspires innovation on kind of a small scale because you can wedge your way into the market with one, you know, clever little uh, detail. I, there's no question that it inspired innovation on a linguistic scale because when patent applications get written, of course, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to maximize everything it will possibly apply to. So I think, you know, there is this game where, um, you know, companies are trying to protect their innovations on one hand. On the other hand, you know, you have this kind of swarm of inventors, some of them very good, some of them a little off their rockers who are trying to find any way into that market that they can. And occasionally you do see something that, that you know, that, that changes the game, right? One innovation that makes something so substantially better that the market kind of goes in that direction. You certainly get a lot of people though who say that the, the system stifles innovation, right? Because it, it, it 
means that once a company gets a marketable patent and, and goes into business, they, they tend to get larger and they can sort of, uh, you know, use the power of the patent to, to crush competition in a lot of ways. But ultimately, I, I, I think that on balance, particularly in the era we're talking about, um, it, it, it encouraged innovation on that kind of small tinkering scale. The example I, I like to use for um, a patent discouraging something, uh, up until shortly after 1900, uh, the, the, you, you couldn't get very uh, wide steel sections. You could get channels, I-beams, angles, things like that. Uh, what, what we today call a wide flange beam didn't exist. And that was invented in, uh, I believe it's Belgium. Uh, the company that invented it got an American patent as well as patents in other countries. And they then shopped it around to the, the big U.S. steel firm saying, we've got a better, a better steel section. It makes a better beam. It makes a better column. And the only uh, company that bit was Bethlehem. They, they licensed that, uh, that shape and the technology required to roll it uh, to the point where what we today call a wide flange beam for several years was called a Bethlehem beam. Uh, because they were the only company in the U.S. making them. Except what you'll notice is that Bethlehem didn't move out of its position of, of uh, distant number two to U.S. steel because people happily continued um, building up shapes by riveting together angles and plates and channels. They, they didn't need to have the wide flange shapes. Uh, and eventually the patent expired and then everybody began rolling them. So it was, it was a true better technology that the intro, its introduction to common practice in the US was delayed by the patent because only Bethlehem had it. Bethlehem charged a higher price because they were the only ones who had it. Uh, so th there's that example. The counter example is, the floor system, is in the floor systems where everybody patented everything. I mean, I, I have in my library a couple of hundred patents for floor systems and unless you get into the, the very small details, you'd have a hard time telling one from the other. And there's some famous names in there patenting tiny changes, as Tom was saying, that probably should have been rejected as, as neither original and obvious. Um, so everybody patented everything. Nobody, made, nobody got that pot of gold because um, the stuff that was already in existence, which is to say, uh, terracotta tile vaults and ordinary concrete beams. Those things hadn't been patented, couldn't be patented. And as a result, there was always a way around the patented floor systems. The, the one sort of interesting example in that is uh, CAP Turner, Claude Turner, um, had a patent on his two-way uh, concrete slab uh, and he, he lost it in a, in a dispute to uh, uh, Norcross uh, except that Norcross's patent was, was unbuildable. It was junk. It should never have been kept patented. But nobody knew that, right? Nobody knew the technology very well in 1900 or 1910, I guess, when the, the patent dispute took place. So there was nobody to say that, that the Norcross patent was junk and shouldn't have been issued, and Turner lost his patent in the dispute, uh, which he was very bitter about. Um, but meanwhile, people were busy building two-way concrete slab buildings. So it did not... This, this drama, which was a very big deal for Turner, um, did not affect people building that type of structure. They just used the generic version of the floor rather than the patented version of the floor. Alice, we have five or six minutes left if you want to take us into a new territory. Um, sure, I can go back to the, the, the overarching theme of Chicago and New York and the comparison in contrast of the city's building cultures. Um, we were discussing just before the lecture, all of us about how um, the building regulations of these cities, right? They, they devolve from the police powers of the state. They're very local. They're, they're municipal issues hammered out between New York City and Albany, Chicago and Springfield. Um, but rather than contrasting the cities, I wonder if in the time period you're discussing the highly regulated nature of building of fire codes in these cities actually contrasts with the vast majority of towns and cities in the United States. 
Yeah, or or even the outlying areas of these cities, right? The, okay. the, the code in Chicago, at least up until the 40s, uh, referred only to the so-called fire district. Um, mm. out, out in the suburbs, you could, for a long time, you could build almost anything you wanted. Mm. And it's interesting, it, it's the, as those suburbs start to become municipalities, especially after World War II, um, that's where you, that's where you see home builders and developers really start to get their like fingers into the into into code writing. You know, municipalities that have been a few hundred people in the 20s and 30s are suddenly a few thousand people, and they realize that they've got to regulate not skyscraper building but house building. Um, and the you know you think the politics get rough downtown, like just you know out in the suburbs. Uh, things are even things are even more fraught. And actually, the the uh, earliest versions of New York State's building code, I think, are referred to as a housing code, not a building code. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is that by 1910, let's say, there were a number a number of uh, of model codes. Um, a group that didn't have any statutory power and nobody asked them, um, got together and they wrote a building code. Uh, National Fire Protection Association did that. Um, a couple of other groups did that. There, there, there are these, these model codes, which honestly are one of the lines of, of development that leads to the current building code that we have today. Um, and they could be adopted and in some cases were adopted by small, smaller cities uh, that weren't going to develop their own code. Uh, or even by towns that weren't going to develop their own code. It, it occurs to me that if you're building a, uh, a large building of some kind, a school, uh, a, a department store, a, a building that has a larger occupancy than a normal house or, or a, small office, a small commercial building, um, it, and you're doing it in a town or a small city that doesn't have a building code in 1910 and 1915, uh, you know, you don't want to make everything up from scratch. And I would, I would love to do some research into whether these buildings follow the model codes or follow the code of the biggest nearby city that has a building code. If it's in, if it's in upstate New York, it follows New York's code. If it's in uh, New Hampshire, it follows Boston's code, that kind of thing. Um, because you had to do something, right? You, you weren't going to make up everything from scratch if you're in the position of designing a building like that. What do you do in an area where there's no there's no building code and you have to um, protect public safety? So I suspect that even though a lot of the country in 1910 and 1920, as late as 1940, was not covered by formal building codes, that people were following either one of the model codes that was floating around or a nearby big city code. Because how else how else could you function? Thank you. Carol? Well, I guess we are um, closing in on um, five hours and 58 minutes worth of the Tom and Don show. <laughs> so congratulations, guys, on, uh, on completing the, uh, the uh, even more than a hat trick um, of, of building technology. Uh, this is not the end. Uh, and uh, we don't want, we, we want to end with a bang and not a whimper uh, since we, uh, as we were discussing earlier, the, the, the lack of disasters and fire and the success of, of creating buildings that were, that were not sites of destruction, disaster and cataclysm is, is, the, is the, the larger and more standard history of the skyscraper. There have, as we well know, um, been um, terrible, uh, terrible disasters uh, that have marked the history, but overall the success of tall buildings um, in sheltering people and keeping them safe has been a continuing saga of improvement. Um, and the technology that we've looked at it from the 1880s forward um, has been a, a refinement of various uh, technologies of economies of construction, of um, speed of construction and uh, enhanced comfort in buildings. And, and I think that's, that's um, a story to lay out that isn't just 
a story of technology and technological advance, or certainly not of technological determinism, as you've shown us in the talks. There are all these other issues that are always being introduced into the kind of you know crosswinds um, of influences um, that shape our buildings and, and shape cities. So uh, I'm inviting all of our listeners uh, and those who, who listen later um, to the various talks to pose questions to the Skyscraper Museum or to Don and, and Tom via the Skyscraper Museum as we try to um, uh, eke out some, some broader narratives from this kind of chop and block uh, analysis that we've brought that seems to make everything more confusing more, rather than more clear. But that is after all what, what history does when you really peer into it. Um, everything um, has reasons, not a reason that it happens. Um, and a, a single meta narrative is never going to be satisfactory. So enriching the history is something that you've helped us do um, over, over these weeks. And we thank you for that, but we're going to make you come back um, and address in broad discussion with, uh, with all of our speakers and hope to add other people, other people's voices into, into the questioning and, and discussion about what are the, the, the various factors that really shape um, the, the, the buildings and the cities, not just of New York and Chicago, but well, well beyond that. So next week, I hope everybody comes back for Alice's talk um, on New York in the 1880s, where we really are going to integrate a lot of these, these various forces in the case study of the Mills Building. Um, and then we'll certainly let everybody know how this series will continue, other topics that will um, that we hope will be suggested to address in, in future discussions in future semesters, as we like to call them. But um, to uh, professors Leslie and, uh, and Friedman, and also thank you, Alex, tonight and see you next time. Um, this has really been an absolutely fantastic display of your, um, your amazing expertise um, and knowledge of these buildings um, and of the, the kind of buddy system that you've developed in these continuing conversations. So for those in Chicago, and we have many people from Chicago on the, on the call tonight and as proved in the, our little polling uh, last week, um, you can see the, the Don and Tom show right there in person in Chicago next week. And I encourage you to, uh, to go out to Don's lecture on the on the 28th uh, and we'll bring it back home to New York and hopefully all together in a space where we can um, sit around a table, a round table and have this discussion again. So um, thanks everybody for tonight for joining us, Dom and Tom and, Don and, Tom and Alex and everyone and um, see you next week. Thanks Bye. Carol. Bye.